This interview is being tape recorded. My name is Paul Maleri and this is X Job Downloaded. And today I'm going to interview Ruth Delasandro. See, my Italian is coming on perfectly. Um, now, Ruth is the daughter of a police lady, policewoman who served during the 1950s. And as a direct result of her mum's great work, she's written a trilogy of books Calling WPC Crockford, calling Detective Crockford, and calling Sergeant Crockford. Good morning, and thank you so much for taking part today. Hello, Paul. It's lovely to be speaking to you. It's funny, isn't it? Because I mean, obviously, we've spoken prior to, to coming on, and there's six degrees of separation and people that we know. And I'd like to put a big thank you out to the Police History Society, because without them, we wouldn't be talking today. You know, that is great. I love the Police History Society. It's they're so such a good resource. It is a great resource. And there's, you know, there's, there's some great people that we can tap their information and, the, and they're so passionate about it. But where did it all begin for you? And what was the inspiration to write this fantastic or these fantastic books about your mum? Well, it's Maggie O'Farrell, the novelist, always said, you never choose a story. The story chooses you. And I've always wanted to be a writer. And the story that's always been just tugging at my sleeve has been, I really ought to write my mother's story because she was she was unique, she was interesting, a great storyteller herself. And because I grew up in a police family, when you grow up in a police family, as you know, Paul, you grow up with stories. And the thing is the stories, they never get embellished because as you know, it's the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth the whole time. So you're yeah. not going to start expanding it and sort of making it sexy if it's not. And as we were speaking about earlier. Um, so I've always had these stories and they get told over and over and over again. So when somebody comes around to dinner, they get told a story. It's the same. You know, you'll be watching a detective television program. My mum would be saying, oh, when I was at Maidenhead, this happened and it would be the same story. And as an impressionable child with a reasonable memory, all these stories that went into my head and I had my own picture of what my mother's career was probably like. And probably quite arrogantly thought, oh, I know everything about 1950s policing, which was going to sort of bite me a bit later on, unfortunately. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so, mom, so my mother herself was the inspiration. Um, and also I would um, call out, call the midwife here when it started. I read the book originally and thought, this is fabulous. And then watched the television series. And what I thought was I could actually do this, but with 1950s police women rather than um, nurses. So that was another little tug of the sleeve. So that's really where where the sort of, you know, nux of it began. Fantastic. You see, because a lot of people don't realise, and I've mentioned this previously, but there were two police services. You had the men's police service and you had the women's police service. And the two would meet and they would work together. But it was a completely different playing field to what it is today. Absolutely. Well, yes. But what was interesting about Berkshire and very different from the Met in my research is actually mum did quite a lot of the same work as men did. So she could she would go to a burglary. She could go to a sudden death. Um, it, they, they stopped. They, she couldn't do nights. They, they didn't allow women to do nights and they wouldn't send them to an armed robbery or something that was particularly violent. And they'd also add into this any of the crimes against women and children as well. So they had that extra remit. But certainly in Berkshire, I mean, she drove a car, she did all sorts of things, you know. So I think there was less delineation in the Berkshire constabulary than in the Met. But yes, absolutely, you were right. There was a delineation there. That's fantastic. And what year did mum join the police service? 1951. So she was working in a solicitor's office opposite Wokingham Police Station very bored with typing. One of the girls left and uh, left her desk by the by the window. So, of course, mum was looking out over, over, over Wokingham Police Station, all the comings and goings there, bored with her typing. And she just thought, you know what? I don't want to be typing anymore. I'm going to join the police force. So she joined the Berkshire Constabulary in 1951. And how old was she at that point? 21. Wow. So she'd and seen the war years? Uh, she'd seen? The war years, as it, you know... Oh. Well, she was a child. And I think one of her main motivations was she'd been through the war years. And that's actually described in chapter one, her sort of war background and what actually got her thinking about it. I think she always felt that she didn't contribute during the war because she was too young. And post-war, it was her chance to give something back to the community. So I think she saw this was her chance to get stuck in and do something really very worthwhile. Um, sort of coming through all that. And her father was a uh, an inspector in Wokingham Specials as well. So, 
and her and her brother was a police was a policeman eventually at Newbury as well. So uh, quite a big service, you know, service family. And why? I, well, you've answered that question, Berkshire, I suppose, is because that's where the family connection was. But um, did she talk to you about the training element that she went through? In yes, order- absolutely. She yeah, well, very interesting at various times of her career because she went to Milmeese Training School, um, so up in the Potteries. Uh, yeah, so that was her thirteen weeks basic training that she that she did up there with obviously all the sort of square pounding and the law and various stuff that she had to do. And she passed that with flying colours, came back to Wokingham. And she was one of the first WPCs there, along with a, a colleague called who I've called in the book Patty Baxter. So there were two of them and a very stern sergeant called I've called Sergeant Robert Shaw. Um, so there were yeah, so the three of them were in, in a station probably with about 42, 45 men, two, three police women there as well. Uh, but yeah, the training, I'll get on to the tra- detective training because there's, there's far more of that in the second book. She talked far more about that than the WPC training. But uh, yeah, yes, the training was extraordinary. Um, was the, from your recollection, was the training just police women up in the potteries or was it men and women? No, it was men and women, I believe. I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, Mill Meese did both of them. And I, I think from various constabularies around. I mean, I know my dad, who was also Berkshire Constabulary, did his training at Sandgate. So I don't know quite where the where some went to Mill Meese, some went to Sandgate. I don't really know what the difference was between them, really. Um, but, yeah, there were men. I can probably tell you it's probably numbers. So oh, what interesting. happened, I went to Ashford uh, Police Training College in, in Kent. And some of my friends went to Shotley because they didn't have space. And it was literally, they'd have a number and they'd just fill the beds and that would, that would be it. They'd have a maximum number. So you could end up going anywhere. I mean, it's a long way to go from Berkshire up to the Potteries. It is, isn't it? Because my mum said that was one of the furthest places she'd ever travelled to in her life, really, was up there. She'd always talk about Staffordshire. Very interesting. Because yeah. now they would go to Sullumstead House, wouldn't they? Well, I, I, um, everything's done locally now. So whatever, yeah. whatever the local one is in Surrey, um, she would... it would be Berkshire. Yes, it's so that oh, would be Sullumstead yeah. House. Yeah. Yeah, which is part of Thames Valley Police now, isn't it? It Bar- is now. Yes, that's right. Yeah, they they amalgamated. Was it 1968? So Oxfordshire, Oxford City. You know, they all am- amalgamated to become the Thames Valley. Yeah, because before uh, they were the Oxfordshire Constabulary, weren't they, or the Hampshire Constabulary, or what? What were the other ones? Buckinghamshire. They were yeah. all separate, but they've all come together now. Yeah, so it's it's quite it's an interesting um, makeup over there. I was over there at Christmas or just before Christmas. When you did your research, how did you go about? Because Mum's no longer with us, sadly. She she passed in two thousand and four. But how did you do your research as to the things that she'd undertaken and and the like? Well, first of all, I, I sat down and wrote down everything I could remember her telling me. And she did actually leave a very small file of papers. Papers, So they had some newspaper clippings that she'd taken out of the Wokingham Times and the Maidenhead Advertiser, things like that. I did have some photographs. Um, and actually, it wasn't very much to make a book out of, quite honestly, even one book. Um, so what I, well, I actually went to the archives of um, the Berkshire Constabulary. And apparently they didn't have any. So and I I know and I've heard since from a, a lovely man who helped me with book three. He said, oh, no, they cleared the archives out and all their ceremonial swords and they put them in a boat and they sailed them into the middle of a gravel pit in, um, in Thiel and dropped a load of stuff into the gravel pit in Thiel. And apparently they've now built a housing estate on top of it. No, I know. So there's a small archive, I believe, held at the Thames Valley Police Museum. But there was nothing about my mum. And they said, well, actually, go and go and ask the Berkshire Record Office. I said, OK, I'll ask the Berkshire Record Office. They're brilliant. They're really helpful. And they came back saying, I'm afraid all we can find about your mum is a note saying a medical has taken place. And when you think, you know, you've got a woman being a first detective and an early pioneer, an 11, un, unheard of 11 year career. And that's the only trace officially that there is of her. You know, it's absolutely shocking. And this is part of my um, sort of crusade, really, to get the contribution of policewomen well recognised. Because, I mean, Thames Valley is pretty shocking as far as that was concerned. Whereas you get something like the West Midlands Police, they've got an entire filing cabinet 
dedicated to their women police. Of course, you have the museum, you have lovely Corinne Brazier, who's, you know, she, she's raising the uh, awareness of, of women police. Um, but a lot of archives have, have actually just fizzled out and died. And the, and the Thames, the Berkshire Constabulary ones and the Thames Valley ones are the worst ones, really. Um, it's absolutely, it is absolutely shocking and a terrible shame because it would have been like finding the Holy Grail to find my mother's personnel file, for example. That would have been wonderful, but it what, didn't happen. What about people that served with her? Because I, I assume that when you started doing the research, there were still people that were around that would have served with mum. Well, what I, that more or less came to the fore in book three, because I put some tendrils out towards Newbury and I, and. The, the research and what I learned about mum kind of built over the three books. So I didn't know a lot when I started. So I had to use real classic research techniques. So the, the research technique I did for book one, I, I've got a British Library card. So I went to the British Library and I took out um, original newspapers of the time and I combed through them all. And every time that there was something, something related to the police or, or my mum's name cropped up, photographed it, put it into a file. And then I built up a picture of her. You know, and then wove in the stories that I knew anyway um, with it. So to make the first book. So that was a, a pretty much a pure historical research book and pretty much similar to, with um, the, the book two. When it came to book three, um, I did actually manage to track down my mother's um, WPC that she worked with, a lovely lady called Rosemary Stark. And I went to see her that very same afternoon. And she sat and she told me all about what she knew about my mum. So that material went into book three. She didn't know her beforehand because she was a 21 year old WPC when she met her. Um, but she, yeah, and she checked the manuscripts and she said, I'm really happy with this. She probably made me out to be a bit better than I actually was. I think, well, you you need to be celebrated as well. You know, don't hide your light under a bushel. Yeah. Um, so yes, I did. And this lovely man, Tony Hunt, who told me about them sailing, sailing it, the stuff and dropping it into the Thiel Reservoir. Um, yeah, he was really helpful. He read the manuscript too. So they knew both my parents because it, that was 1960 and 1962, which is in living memory. I think when you go back to 1951 and up till 1960, it's kind of gone out of living memory now. So a lot of people have passed away. And I think the last Berkshire policewoman of that time passed away a couple of years ago. So that time ha has really faded back into history. Whereas the 60s, you've still got people who remember it. So so it was a journey. It was an incredible journey going from being a, a pure sort of, you know, researcher through to actually finding people, uh, you know, unearthing new things. Actually, more things got published as well, uh, because there actually is, there's a burgeoning interest in women police. And I'm so happy to see that because the Police History Society, of course, have released their, their book, Women Police, as well. You know, Corinne, Corinne at the West Midlands has done her book. Um, so there is that that interest. And I'm delighted because there was just nothing. It, it's almost as if the women police have been airbrushed out of history. So it's brilliant to get their contributions out there because they were absolutely extraordinary. The women that were working, you know, absolutely amazing. Uh, uh, they were. I, I'll, I'll tell you a very quick story. When my brother and my dad was a policeman and my yeah. brother, and I, uh, my dad was a policeman in Colchester and my brother and I would go to my grandmother's and grandfather's every Friday or on Friday evenings and we'd stay the weekend and my mum and dad would come and pick us up. And there was a lady called Una Francis who's sadly no longer with us and she was in the women's police department. So this is 1972, 73. Yeah. And she put us in the back of her green Morris Minor and drive us the 15, 18 miles to my grandparents. I mean, it's just, and I just, you know, she was legendary. Yeah. You Una Francis, may she rest in peace, she was legendary yes. uh, in the Women's Police Service. And like you say, the beauty of what we're doing today is that it will be recorded forever and ever, amen. So yes. the fact that history comes in different formats, but this form of history, social history, means that in 100 years' time, your mum's memory will be maintained within the books, but the fact that we're talking about her is absolutely super you know 90 odd years after she was born yeah. is absolutely superb and she would be thr she'd be absolutely thrilled i mean she obviously wouldn't understand any of the technology we're on a, you know we're talking to each other on, on a computer screen you know she would no she would be thrilled because she i think she's very modest about what she did um, my dad i mean my dad always said your mother was the first woman detective in the Berkshire constabulary you know and i thought yeah, yeah, but he, but he said it so many times that came, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know, but but that's extraordinary. It suddenly dawned on me. It's an extraordinary achievement, you know, incredible. Have you had any access to any court files 
where that she was the officer in the case where, where... no I, I haven't actually because I well to be honest you find so much in the old newspapers because unlike today you know, everything that happened in Wokingham or Maidenhead is all detailed within the newspaper so you would actually get court notes so they'd say such and such a case so actually some of the cases I followed through consecutive consecutively in the newspapers and wow. I could find it yeah and I could find up quotes and, and, and what happened and who said what the detail is extraordinary so I actually didn't need that level of detail for these books because you know obviously there has to be a little bit of storytelling a little bit of embellishment going on um, but now I didn't need to do that fantastic yeah. fantastic yeah. what do you what do you think I mean you, you said that your mum would be absolutely wrapped with it but what do your kids think of this as a as a as a project and do they understand what their their grandmother did oh i think they do and i think they in a way they probably with, with me and my books now i think it's almost like me going oh bar mum's the first woman detective i think they're going yeah my mum's written three books she's an author the you know but but they no they they well they were the, partly part of the inspiration because they both did history a level and they studied the cold war and then in britain in the 1950s and actually, they were both really passionate about it. And we got talking about the social history, what talking about the whole sort of Russia, America tensions, you know, and it just made me really fascinated. And then, of course, along with Call the Midwife, along with their cold, I think I just kind of I'm getting to know this period of history. I'm getting to feel I could write about it. Um, so they have been instrumental in helping me, you know, to formulate it. And my, you know, my daughter found a beautiful fact about Khrushchev, which is hilarious. Um, apparently he had, he had a hissy fit because he couldn't go to Disneyland and he sort of he, he had a complete temper tantrum so and, and my daughter's lovely line was was he was a big baby but the problem was he was a big baby with an atom bomb you know? right that's going in the book that's a beautiful turn of phrase so yeah I mean I think they're pretty proud of their their grandmother and I'm really pleased about that because she didn't know them for very long I mean my you know she was only my first daughter was only two when mum died and my little one was only seven months so right. So that my, you know, my mum didn't have many, much time with them, but you know, she has immortalised now for them. Absolutely, absolutely. And what cases do you pick out of the, out of the three books? Which ones do you find the funniest or in, most inspirational? Well, there's some quite, there's quite a lot of very interesting ones, and probably ones that your listeners will know from book one. Uh, mum was on duty when John Straffen escaped from Broadmoor and murdered Linda Bowyer in the four hours that he was out. Wow. So mum, so because mum talked about John Straffen and it, actually he was a bogeyman in my childhood because she'd come that close to like pure evil child murderer that she was really scared to let me go out and play because she was convinced that there was going to be another John Straffen around every corner to murder her child because it's quite traumatising working on a case like that. His was awful. So John Straffen in book one, also the, um, the Ascot Races lightning strikes. In right. 1955, you know, it killed two people and injured loads. She was there doing first aid on people who'd got caught in the crush. Um, so they're the two sort of serious real life cases from book one. Um, book two is book two deals with them, um, the treatment of uh, terrible treatment of gay men, actually, in the 50s by the police. And the whole story is all about, well, why is this character being found dead underneath the railway arches? What was he doing there? And the story kind of unwinds and we understand the social history about that. Um, and then in book, th in book three, we step into the Cold War. And so we have the Aldermaston marches. We have an attempted murder at um, Greenham Common Air, Air Force Base. So we have all the idea of the US Air Force and their role in Newbury. Um, and there's actually there's a, there's a it's a rape case is the central one of, um, of uh, book three. And it's the treatment of rape victims by the courts as well. And how mum, as an empathetic woman, you know, was really up against it with the actual attitudes towards women and sexual assault. Um, the three books sort of slot into three categories. The first one is a lot about crimes against children and taking them away from abusive homes. And the second book deals very strongly with the with um, either the police treatment of gay men and homosexuality being a crime. And the third book is Crimes Against Adult Women. So it slots very neatly into those three remits that my mum had. And they're just loads and loads of cases. I mean, they're almost too many to mention. You'd be here till this evening talking to me about them. <laughs> but don't you think it's sad that 70 years on, we're still talking about violence against women and girls. 
Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. Have we learnt nothing? Have we learnt nothing? It's so upsetting. I mean, you, you know, the Sarah, Sarah Everard, and you've even got, you know, yeah. you don't tar every policeman with that brush. It's like saying every GP is the same as, you know, the... Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's... it's it, yeah, what's... I don't know what the answer is. I just don't know what the answer is. I think I think policing has evolved quite dramatically. I, I do think that um, there are issues around recruitment. I, I, I do believe that. And I don't think that the police services, it's not a vocation anymore. That's that's part of, part of the issue for me. But the evolution around equality, the fact that we don't have a, a women's police service anymore, that is the police service, that homosexuality is no longer a crime, you know, that's massive leaps because it's it's been a crime for so long and all yes. you know, and, and so in such a short space of time that part has evolved. But you know, a, abuse of children and that's never been so prevalent because of the online culture. Yeah, exactly. There's I mean, you know, paedophiles will always find a way. I remember talking to my father because he was terribly upset about the Moors murders and he was saying, oh, it's because of tape recorders being able to, you know, tape something. All technology is aiding these people. And you think, well, no, the tape recorders do good in 99.9% .9 of cases. The internet does good in not 99% maybe, but uh, in most cases, but, en but anybody will find a tool to do something bad with it, won't they? They will find a way of sort of abusing. And it's so international. I mean, mum, mum would be completely non plus seeing, you know, the, the cyber crime, the cyber units, the online grooming. She would be absolutely horrified. But again, she would say, well, has it ever been thus? It's just that, you know, more tools are available for bad people to do bad things. I think that's what that's what she would say. And, and child abuse, if you go back to the Victorian times, was as rife then as it probably is now, but it's just yes. just manifested itself in a different way. It absolutely is. It absolutely is. And, and that's and and say so book one goes into that detail. She managed to work out what was going on with a deprived family, and by various threads, she managed to bring the perpetrator to justice. And I'm very proud of her about, with that. So uh, yes, yeah, so that's the central story in book one. Brilliant. So. How do I become an author? Talk me, talk me through how you <laughs> how you became an author because I I'm illiterate. Let's put it that way. I, I I am I'm not a reader. I'm a listener. I listen to books. I'm, I I like to have tangible things around me, but the fact is that I will have a book and then I'll listen to it. Uh, that you are a reader, even if you listen to books, you are absorbing. Um, literature. So, we're, and I think the whole rise of audiobooks podcasts is absolutely fantastic because, yeah, we want to get on with our lives, but we can also listen. I mean, not many of us have got time to physically sit down and read a book, but we could be painting a wall, we could be digging a garden, we've got a podcast going, we've got an audiobook going. Fantastic. Audible, you know, really happy about that. So, you, if you want, just write. That's all I say. If you want to be a writer, just write. Just write something, you know. And I would say there's, a story, as I was saying to you before, it's the story. You don't choose a story. A story chooses you. It tugs at your sleeve. If you close your eyes and think, what story should I tell? Every time I said that, I thought, mum's mum story, mum's story. You've got to do it. So, yeah, just put pen to paper and just write something, actually. And then as, when it begins to form, then you can maybe start doing a course. And the way the way I did it, because I was a, a commercial writer anyway, I thought, well, I do need to learn structures because actually writing a book is very formulaic it has to have curves and dips and challenges and a, a character arc books are really quite formulaic and that you can learn how to structure a book especially crime crime is incredibly formulaic it literally is you have to have a murder you have to have this the detective has to have some problems they've got to come up against things you have a resolution so i would say um actually look at look look for a, a novel writing course and it will tell you how to deal with character how to deal with dialogue how to do plotting you can learn it and that's exactly what i did before i started writing my initial novel i thought well, i ought to learn how to do this um and just just do some courses just had a go just tried and then when i had when i got the story I got so passionate about the story that actually it just flowed and I couldn't stop doing it. So I was awake at six o'clock in the morning on my laptop. I was, you know, at any time I had, I was carried on going. 
I think it's having the passion. And I believe with all the stuff you do, Paul, you must have things that are passions. And you think, well, actually, that's a passion. Maybe I could translate that into just some words. Honestly, yeah. that's when I'd say start. I, and I would love to because I've got so many things in my mind that I could write about. But I'll be really honest with you, my grammar is terrible. I'm useless with punctuation and all that. And I think that, I think there's probably people listening to this who have got a book. Everybody's got a book in them, haven't they? That's they, the- they do. They do. And the, and the joke is in a lot of people, that's where it should stay. Well, absolutely. <laughs> but, but the problem is not everybody can, you know, punctuation. Doesn't and- matter. You have editors for that, Paul. But, but Edit, I, I, I sort like that out. piece for my podcast, and I'll be worried that you'll be reading it, going, "What on earth did you? What have you written there?" You know, it's just no, I, I, no. To be honest, it's also being kind to other people and their efforts as well. You've bothered, you know, you've bothered to write something about me for a podcast. That's that'll do me. Yeah, but it's, I think we're all sometimes we're quite um, critical, aren't we? If if we're honest, we're critical of what we do. And whilst other people go, oh, that's really good, you think, oh, I don't like that. I, I, I've i never watched. I, I did um, a television series with uh, Robert Rinder. We'll, we'll come on to him. And I've never watched it. I've never watched it because I have just have never watched it. And there's there's 10 yeah. episodes and, there's, and I'm in eight of them and I've never, ever watched it. Don't you you think... might be t- too close to the material. Are you a bit too close to the material? You were so involved with it, you actually don't want to see how it turned out. And you, you, you may come to that in a few years' time and go, "Oh, we'll have a look." Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it is. But can I can I ask you where did you get the inspiration for the names? Because you've already said that you had, had changed some of the, some of the names and and what have you within your within your novels. Yeah. How did you how did you choose the names? What of the characters? Yeah, because D.I. Dankworth, I mean, Johnny Dankworth <laughs> is a very famous <laughs> musician. Um, where, where, did, where did the inspiration come for, for those? It's just the, the vision I had of him in, in his head. He started off as Richardson, and actually Richardson was a little bit of a boring name to, for, for a character in quite a quirky novel. So I just thought, oh, he'll be long and thin, he'll have a grey face, he'll have a grey mac. He's Dank. Oh, Dankworth, you know, so, so that's where Dankworth has come from. Um, obviously, I've had to change. I've changed the names of people who I'm not 100 percent certain exactly what they did. And, and it's come from, it hasn't come from the horse's mouth. So later books, it's like in book three, Rosemary Churchill is Rosemary Churchill because she actually told me all the stuff that she did. And she's given me her blessing to use her name. So I've fictionalized slightly. Um, we well, have to. The legal department tells you to fictionalize slightly anyway, so that you don't get into trouble with you know, people. I mean, you can't libel dead people, but by the same token, I don't want to upset any sort of family members or anything like that. No, I, I absolutely agree. I, yeah, I've, yeah. I've made it quite. You know, some of the true crime stuff that I do, where um, people are maligned, I think that that's quite. Not that we do that. We're very. Uh, I work with a brilliant TV company called Revelation Films, and everything we do is factual and. If there wasn't a person involved in it, then they don't get involved in the, in the television production. We don't go down the you know the fantasist route. But I do yeah. get disappointed when um, people start not that you've done it, but when people start criticising uh, former police officers who are now dead. But they're not here to defend themselves, you know. And it, you, I know you can you can say what you like about the dead, but it really does hurt their family, doesn't it? It does, and I'll be very, and I'm very careful to sort of make sure that's all covered up. And I mean, unless they were a complete, uh, you know, you know, were problematic, in which case that's all in the public domain anyway, really. But uh, yeah, no, I think it's it, changing names or not mentioning names actually really helps, um, unless they're given the blessing to do it. Um, yeah, so I, I get what you where you're coming from with that. Absolutely, and uh, the the lovely Jackie Moulton, who's um, yes, is a great supporter of you and and, and what you do. And and she, you know, she joined in 1969, so not too far after Mum in in real terms. And in those 19 years, the police service was still the women's police service. You know, they, they still. It, it was only in 1974 ish that it, it it changed. But I find it fascinating. I find police history particularly fascinating because of the types of cases. And you're quite right that we as um, former police officers we are quite good at holding stories and they cannot be embellished because there's somebody else who would have been involved in them exactly 
Although, yeah, and I'm, I'm waiting for people to come out of the woodwork and say, I was there and it's all wrong, but they haven't so far. Well, and, and my dad calls them OBEs, other buggers' efforts, because what happens is you get somebody that will come along and say, <laughs> They'll, they'll embellish something in order to get themselves promoted, which is quite, you know, I'm sure it happened all the time. Uh, where, so, you know, I did this, I did that. And no, you didn't. You know, you, you, you start to find these things out. But yeah, it, it is fascinating. So what next? What's going to happen next with Ruth? How are you well, going to progress this, uh, this brilliant, brilliant series? Well, um obviously of publicizing it because I don't the publisher doesn't really do any publicity so it's down to me to do it but then of course I bring quite a lot of passion to what I do so so I've got various events around um, sort of the south of England over the summer various libraries I'm going to WIs to talk about um, things obviously your podcast which is absolutely fantastic um, so so I'll carry on publicizing um, to the extent eventually we'll reach sort of saturation point I mean, what would be absolutely lovely is if a film or television company picks it up and then takes it on to be a series or a film because it would lend itself really well to being a police based call the midwife. I mean, that's in effect what it is, except it may be even grittier. It's pretty gritty in places. I mean, if anybody picking them up and thinking it's a, a cosy read, there's postmortems, there's horrific injury detail. There's pretty strong themes in it, actually. Um, so yeah, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be fluffy. Um, so I've actually I'm actually thinking about my next book, which would be would be fiction this time, and I would pick up my father's story. Now he was a he was actually in the Second World War, and he was based during the Siege of Malta, which is quite a little known theatre of war, really. It's it's like he, poor dad. He ended up in a lot of the forgotten theatres of war. Um, so he, yeah, so he was at, at the siege of Malta. So I, he actually kept reasonable records and photographs and a scrapbook. So I have a lot of material from him. And actually, finding stuff about Malta is not difficult online. And you have the Times of Malta. So I won't have that real feeling with Mum that I've got to dig so deep into the bottom of archives and really put things together. So it will be fiction. It will have a contemporary sort of out. You know, it will be a D, it's a DNA ancestry family mystery modern day but it will be set with a Malta with a Malta um W Second World War story at its heart just started researching it that's the, that's the next story that's tugging my sleeve on that I just want to carry on writing Paul that's the thing I I I, I want the Crockford series to be as big a success as possible I'd love to do this Malta story which actually my agent really loves I had a meeting with her and she said just do it yeah it's great just get on with it so yeah I just hope that this is going to be a full-time job Good for you. So where are you going to be for your book tour? How do we get to see you? And can you send me the links so that I can put them into the body of the text for this podcast? That would be fantastic. Well, one, I'm going to want, Wantage Library on Friday. I will be there with my illustrated talk about book three. So it'll be all funny things about the Cold War and various things like that. I'll be at Oxted Library in Surrey. And that's on the 22nd of June. And then I haven't got a lot going on in July and August because a lot of people are away on holiday. Picking up again in September, I will be at Maidenhead Library. So I will be doing a talk about when mum was the first woman detective based at Maidenhead and Windsor. Um, that will be interesting. Um, so I'll be there and various WIs in the in the area um, and anything that's kind of crops up of, you know, I, I, I have to do my own book tour. So and libraries have been really, really good to me, actually. So literary festivals hard to get into, but libraries have been fantastic. So. I get a lot of traction from libraries, but how, I will send you. And how do we buy your books? You can get them from bookshops. You might have to ask them to order them in. You can get them online from Amazon and online booksellers. And you can also get them from your local library as well. Support your local library by by getting them. So uh, I, I will show them to you. So there's WPC. First one Fantastic. and then detective. Excellent. Second one. The only thing is that the, the writing's come out the wrong way round. And there's Sergeant, the third one. Sure. Um, but yeah, and it's they're also available um, on Kindle and as audiobooks as well. The lovely Rachel Atkins, who was in The Archers and The Fireman's Wife in Chernobyl, reads them and she's done a fabulous job. So yeah, just stick your earphones in and listen to WPC Crockford. And I will be doing that immediately after this podcast fantastic when you dig when you're digging with your, in your veg patch yeah, <laughs> your granddaughter. yeah she was oh, she was delightful 
But you've had some critical acclaim, haven't you? My lovely friend Robert Rinder has read these books. Now, yes. how did these fall on his desk? And yeah, he's he's written a piece saying what a great job you've done. Yeah, well, I've got a lovely endorsement uh, on, on all the books. Um, I believe, uh, well, my lovely commissioning editor was a lady called Ida Vucicevic, and she was at Welbeck, and she said, I love these books, I love these books, let's get them published. And, I mean, she is a great character, and she and she's ended up going to HarperCollins as their publishing director. I mean, she sure. absolutely deserves to be where she is because she's fantastic. But then she said, oh, I'm going to get you a quote, I'm going to get you a quote. She said, oh, I know, I will talk to my friend Robert Rinder. So, I mean, whether she gave him a copy of the books, I don't know, but he but he gave a lovely quote on the front. So I'm forever grateful for Robert, especially as I love what he does on television. I just I watched his Who Do You Think You Are? Cried all through that. And I watched his program about the Holocaust, cried all the way through that. And I am going to watch his trip round art trip round Venice with Ryland because I think that just looks like a wonderful television program. So, yeah, big fan of Rob, actually. It really is good. And I was privileged to be with him three weeks ago at a Holocaust survivors event. Wow. And, yeah. yeah, absolutely wow. And I was and on the table with us was David Vinson, who's the producer of Who Do You Think You Are? Okay. Yeah. So I'm very, very lucky and I will make sure that uh, your kind wishes goes go to him. Yeah. Yeah, well, please do actually, because a few people have gone, Oh, wait, Judge Rinder. Oh yeah, yeah, Judge Rinder. <laughs> he's he's lovely. Yeah. Well, look, we have a have a saying in the police service when we interview somebody at the conclusion of an interview, we always give them the opportunity to add, alter or correct anything that they've said in their interview. Now, I'm going to give you that opportunity, which is quite alien to you because you're not a police officer mm -hmm. and it's not something that I would imagine you've ever been interviewed by. A police <laughs> officer. Oh, than... I have my mother. Oh, my <laughs> mother. She God, she was interviewed me all the time. <laughs> Well, actually, I'm going to just read you a very little tiny bit about what it was like um, being interviewed by a mother. So let me let me just let you know on this. Um, where are we? Um, sorry, I should have prepared this beforehand. No, um, this, this is the, <laughs> what people don't realise is that we've literally had one quick email to say, can we do this? And yeah. that's it. This is this is organic. This is what <laughs> this is what I do. I had somebody the other day say, can you send me all the questions? I, said, I haven't got time to send you all the questions. No, it's much a, better. To... It's a conversation. You know, you, you're you given the opportunity to deliver. Yes. You either take the opportunity or you don't take the opportunity. It makes for a dull podcast if you don't talk yes. to me. But... Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, it very, it's just a, it's a beautiful question, actually. So my mind, as soon as you were asking, my mind was going, oh, actually, I know exactly what I can do with this. Because, yes, I was interviewed by a detective quite a lot. And this is what I said in, in I put an addendum at the back of book three. What was my mum like? What was Detective Crockford like as a mum? So being the daughter of a detective meant I couldn't get away with anything. Mum could spot a fib at 20 paces, and as a child, I was convinced she could read my mind. I realise now that she was way ahead of her time, highly skilled at reading what we know as body language. An aversion of the eyes, a slight blush to the cheek, an arm across the body, she could interpret all these non-verbal signals of lying. She would call out untruths with a penetrating stare from those olive green eyes that made all but the most brazen own up. And when I thought I'd perfected my ability to get something past her, she'd pull out the forensic card. We had a lovely old apple tree in our garden with the crisp, sweet beauty of Bath variety growing on it. Because of the heritage nature of the apples and mum's wartime waste nothing mentality, we had to eat the windfalls off the ground first before the ceremonial picking of the juiciest apples in August. One day I picked the biggest apple off the tree and swore blind to mum I'd found it on the ground. She took it off me checked the end of the stalk and said, no, you didn't. The end of this stalk is green, showing it's just picked. If you'd found it on the ground, the end of the stalk would be brown. I started colouring the end of my forbidden apple stalks with a brown, water-soluble Caran d'Ache pencil. Fantastic. <laughs> so Fantastic. there we go. That's <laughs> well, I, I'm so grateful for your time. I hope you've enjoyed the experience of been interviewed by an amateur podcaster. I and could chat all day, Paul. This is fabulous. Thanks so much. Have a lovely day. Yeah, you too, Paul. And I'll speak to you when you're older. <laughs> In a minute's time. Okay, God cheers. Bye-bye now. Bye, Paul. <laughs>